Hello and welcome to another edition of Fides Podcast. My name is Jerry Serino and I'm your host and I'm here with talent on loan from Rush. Uh, I am re-recording a presentation that I did at Kent State University the other day uh, for the Students for Life organization uh, because I uh, unfortunately had uh, some bad technical issues that didn't allow me to properly record and download the audio and the video. So I wanted to re-record. Uh, the benefit is that it's here in studio, so the sound is going to be very, very good. Unfortunately, the negative is that I do not have the great, great questions uh, that were asked after the presentation, and there were many great questions. So I wanted to re-record this so that everybody can have an opportunity to listen and watch the entire presentation, but this is the exact presentation that I gave. So I first want to um, thank Linnea uh, Pringle, for, um, who was the president of Students for Life at Kent State University. Uh, she had me here. She hosted. She's, she was a really great, great person. Linnea, thank you so much for uh, hosting me. Uh, you did a great job. Uh, everything went very, very well. So thank you. I appreciate you. And hopefully many, many people join Students for Life at Kent State or wherever school you're at. Find out, join, connect with Students for Life and get involved. Um, specifically at Kent, get involved with Linnea. And I want to say a special hi to Linnea's mom, who is going to be, who was listening. I know she wanted to be there and listen. Uh, the other night, we wanted to live stream it for her, uh, but uh, unfortunately, we couldn't do that. So uh, Linnea's mom, great job with Linnea. She's great. Um, and I also wanted to have, uh, say, a specific shout out to those that came uh, on Thursday at Kent State University, to all those that came in support, thank you. And those that came and were on the opposite side, I also want to thank you for number one, coming, and number two, for being very, very uh, professional, civil. Uh, not that I expected anything different, but you just never know. Uh, you were all really fantastic, had great questions, and uh, were really, really uh, great, and I appreciate that. So let's get right into it. So the name of my presentation, my talk is the truth about abortion, exposing the lies of the left. So the one thing I want to do um, in, in this presentation is to start off with a video. And the video is, uh, it's difficult to see. It's even difficult to hear. Uh, but it's important because I think this gets to the heart of what this issue is, what this issue is about. It's not about tax policy or trade policy or all these other things that, while maybe important, are certainly not as important is the issue of abortion. And when the left has been lying to all of us for decades and decades, we have to know what exactly it is they're lying about. I just arrived at work as the hospital's lead sonographer and was looking at the patient's schedule for the day when my boss told me to go immediately to the OR. The surgeon was requesting ultrasound guidance. That was all the information I was given. I had no idea what I was walking into. I wheeled the ultrasound machine into the OR. The patient was already sedated on the operating table. Plugging in the machine, I waited for instructions from the doctor. He barked at me to place the ultrasound probe on the patient's pelvis so he wouldn't perforate her uterus. Still confused about the procedure, I did as he asked and realized the woman was pregnant. She was in her second trimester, so I easily determined the gender of her baby, a little girl. Stunned, I watched the doctor thrust a catheter into the amniotic sac. The fetus dodged the catheter and tried to hide in the top of her mother's uterus to get away. In horror, I watched as he inserted a forceps clamp and grabbed her tiny leg. She writhed around in pain, trying to break free, but there was nowhere for her to go. Then the doctor pulled hard until her leg ripped away from her body. She recoiled and violently twisted around in pain and curled herself into a tight ball. But it was no use. The clamp grabbed her arm and she struggled to pull away. Her movements weakened now because she was dying. He pulled her arm off of her body. My vision blurred. My eyes filled with tears. 
The child again curled herself into a tight ball, but again, the device grabbed her other leg and it was ripped from her body. By now, her heartbeat had slowed significantly, but she was still alive. The clamp grabbed her last limb and ripped it off. She wiggled and squirmed around, and then her heart finally stopped beating. I announced that there was no more cardiac activity. The nurse and scrub tech in the room gasped, realizing for the first time that this was happening to a fetus that was still alive. The remaining body parts, the head and torso, were removed. Placenta was removed, and a final look with ultrasound revealed all products of conception were removed. I was told I could leave the room. Up until that moment, I had been frozen. I silently removed the ultrasound machine from the operating room, went directly to the locker room, and threw up. I quit my job at that hospital shortly after. I told my boss I would never again participate in that type of procedure. I was having nightmares and could not escape the memory of what I had witnessed. I would never again assist in the murder of a child. It was over 20 years ago, but it's just as vivid in my mind today as the day it happened. The saddest part is that this procedure is still happening today. People have no idea we are murdering babies in this way. They think it isn't a person, that it's just a mass of tissue. I'm so sorry for what happened to this little girl. For what I did to her. I'm sorry, sweetheart. I'm so sorry. So that video is difficult to watch, but it's true. It's 100% true. That is exactly one of the many ways in which babies are killed every single day in this country and throughout the world. It is evil. It is a travesty. And the truth is, as I said, the left has been lying to all of us for a long time. And whenever someone lies, it's not, remember, it's not that they're wrong. It's that they're lying. They are purposely telling all of us wrong and false information in order to get us to buy into whatever it is that they're selling. And what they're selling is death. So let's talk about these lies. So let's talk about Roe versus Wade. In the beginning, there was Roe, right? I used in the beginning as a biblical reference because people have looked, the left has looked at Roe versus Wade as though Roe versus Wade was, was, you know, the holy grail of, of court cases. The Supreme Court brought down this great and wonderful Supreme Court decision that legalized abortion. When in reality, there's a lot more to Roe than the left has told us. So let's first talk about some of the facts. I'm not going to get into every little detail. At the bottom of the screen, you can see I, I reference, and I'll do this all throughout the presentation. I have a lot of references so that you can go and look things up. But there's some great videos about the truth or facts about Roe versus Wade that you can take a look at. But look, look at a couple things. First, we need to note that there was also a case called Doe v. Bolton. And, and that was, you know, judged at the same time as Roe v. Wade. But let's talk about Roe v. Wade. Jane Roe was the Roe, was actually a woman named Norma McCorvey. And uh, Mary, Bol Mary Doe was actually a woman named Sandra Kano. Both of these women were used and lied to and manipulated by their lawyers. Norma McCorvey's lawyers, Sarah Weddington and Linda Coffey, they, they took her out. They needed her as a client. They needed her pregnant. And they took her out and got her drunk. And she writes about this. And they used her. They misled her. They didn't communicate with her afterwards. All they needed was her signature. And they needed her to be pregnant at the time. She wanted an abortion. And they could have helped her get one. Now, we're glad that she didn't have one. But the point is, is that if they wanted to and wanted to help her, they could have and they didn't, thankfully. But then let's look at the justice. One of the justices here, Justice Harry Blackman, he stated in the first trimester, no restrictions to abortion. 
second trimester, you can have some restrictions. In the third uh, trimester, you can potentially even have complete restrictions on abortion. My only point in this is to say that it wasn't this cut and dry, abortion is legal from beginning to end. It didn't. It still had some areas, gray areas in it, even in with Justice Blackman, who wrote in the affirmative in Roe v. Wade. They also used the right to privacy, right? We've heard that many times, the right to privacy. Well, that was in a case they were basing it on, on Griswold versus Connecticut, in 1965, which allowed for privacy for married couples to use contraception. That's a huge, huge stretch, right? A huge stretch to, to take something like that and make that into a right to abortion based upon privacy. Okay. Give me a break. It is not Roe v. Wade is not the Holy grail of laws in this country. As I mentioned that Norma and uh, Sandra were both used by and lied to by their lawyers. Uh, Norma McCorvey became a pro-life advocate. She wrote a book on pro-life and Sandra never actually even wanted an abortion. She didn't. And she said that she never signed or was tricked into signing papers in order to bring forward the court case by her lawyer. Both of these women were used and manipulated by their female lawyers. And Justice Blackman specifically stated that if prenatal personhood is established, the case for abortion collapses, for the fetus's right to life would then be guaranteed specifically by the 14th Amendment. So he's saying that if technology and medicine and science show that it is a living human being, then this case essentially is dissolved and that baby is protected under the 14th Amendment. So he even stated it there. And therefore, based upon that alone, this case should have been overturned many, many years ago. But how many people knew that? Let's talk about else that not a lot of people know, and that's Dr. Bernard Nathanson. He was integral in the Roe v. Wade case as far as uh, uh, providing support and providing influence and trying to convince people of the righteousness of it. He was the founder of NARAL. He presided over 60,000 abortions. So he was very pro-abortion. He made money off of it. He was a pro-abortion doctor. But nobody tells you that he changed his mind. This is relevant because he was someone that understood abortion. He was doing them. And he ultimately converted to Catholicism. He wrote a book. He did a documentary called The Silent Scream. And he wrote that he changed his mind. This is the first quote here. Because the new scientific data, which we were getting from advanced technology, persuaded me that we could not discriminately continue to slaughter what was demonstrably a human being. In other words, the technology has shown us that this is not some clump of cells or insignificant thing. It's a human being. And then he wrote uh, a quote here. The second quote is, it's hard to convince yourself you're not taking human life when you're throwing little arms and legs into a bucket. That's powerful. How many people know that someone like him changed their views and why he changed his views? That's a fact that the left has not told you. And you know, something I found interesting about NARAL in the top, uh, the very top image uh, is their saying, freedom is for everybody, right? And if you look at the picture below that, I always ask the question, well, whose body are you needing freedom for? The baby's body or the mom's body? The picture on the left, on the top left, stop the war on women. Well, which woman? The adult woman or the female baby woman? My body, my choice on the far right. Whose body? <laughs> Does anyone give the baby a choice? Which one? Which one are they? is NARAL for? That, needless to say, we know who they're for. So the notion of a clump of cells, right? This has been told forever and ever. It's a clump of cells. It's nothing. What, what are we worried about here? It's nothing. It's insignificant. But the fact of the matter is, is that the, from the moment of conception, that baby has a unique DNA, never before seen and never to be seen again. It's its own. It's not mine. It's not yours. It's not one of the parents. It's not exact. It's 
their own unique DNA from the moment of conception, and it's human DNA. We know that. Science tells us that. There's seven weeks, which is nothing. Women sometimes don't even know they're pregnant or for certain that they're pregnant. It's seven weeks. We have a heartbeat for a couple weeks already. And the baby has doubled in size in just one week from week six to week seven. It's doubled in size. This is not a clump of cells. Twelve weeks. Look at the end. We, again, there's no question that this is a human being. Everyone knows that. The left knows it. But the baby is able to open and close its fingers and move and curl its toes. Right? This is a human being. A human being, and we know it. And the left knows it. So the whole notion of a clump of cells, the fact of the matter is, is that all of us have go through stages. If you look to the, the, the image on the right, the oldest, the elderly person, at one time that elderly person was a middle-aged person and then was a teenager and was crawling on the ground like the, the, the individual on the far left of that right-handed picture. And before that baby was crawling, that baby was at various stages in the womb. That's all we are is going through stages. And those stages begin inside the mother. It is a life. Something I found extremely interesting and very compelling was the fact that there are um, surgeries being conducted on babies inside the womb before they're born. There's uh, at the bottom of this picture here of this slide are three videos. You can, uh, you know, you could go to those videos and actually watch these surgeries taking place. These are surgeries in utero of a baby. They open up the mother. They open up the baby. They conduct the surgery, whatever that surgery might be. They even give the baby anesthesia, right? They do the surgery, close the baby back up, close the mother back up. And the mother goes home and maybe a few months later or whatever time frame delivers a baby, right? This is not a clump of cells, unrecognizable. This is a human being. The picture on the right is a picture of a baby holding the finger of the doctor, right? This is a human being. Let's talk about St. Margaret Sanger. Right? The left has tried to cover up and hide who she was and who she really was. She was the founder of Planned Parenthood. And all that I'm about to tell you is not anything new or not anything that I discovered just recently. And I, you know, this is all information that has been known for decades and decades and decades about Margaret Sanger. And here's Hillary Clinton, for example, getting an award uh, by the president of Planned Parenthood at the time. And Hillary Clinton and others have said that they admire Margaret Sanger. They admired her, who she was. They can't hide from that. But everything about her has been known since the very, very beginning. So what have they done? They've hid what she believed and what she really wanted. Right. She wanted to kill babies. She wanted to get rid of them for population control and to get rid of inferior human beings. She talked about killing a, a child from a large family is merciful. And she was certainly a racist individual saying is she doesn't we need to keep it quiet and we don't let the word get out that we want to exterminate the Negro population. All of these things are cited. Anyone could go and find this information. And everyone on the left has known all of this information for a long time. Look at what she said here. I read this whole quote, but you can see it. She accepted uh, to, to come and give a talk to KKK rallies. This is what she did. Imagine if I was found out to have, have done something like this or anyone else was. This is what she did. And Hillary Clinton and all these leftists admired her. And they hid this information from you, from the public in general. This is who Margaret Sanger was. And if you look at this quote, she wrote, colored people are like weeds and are to be exterminated. She viewed them as a, as a drain on society and wanted them gone. That was her belief system. And that was St. Margaret Sanger.
favor of Planned Parenthood. Hold very, very often that we need Planned Parenthood. We can't defund Planned Parenthood. If you defund Planned Parenthood, women are going to suffer. Poor people are going to suffer. Where are they going to get their health care or their health services? Right? That's a lie, and they know it's a lie. This isn't anything that somehow I've discovered. This is what has been known and is easily accept accessible to anyone at any time. Planned Parenthood has 700 clinics and serves 2.8 million people a year. Federally qualified health centers, FQHCs, which are free health centers that are there for people who don't, who need it, who don't have money or insurance or whatever. There are 9,000 of them. Like looking at the graph on the left <laughs> shows the massive difference between the number of Planned Parenthoods and the number of FQHCs. And the graph on the right shows the number of patients helped every year by FQHCs versus Planned Parenthood. The fact is, is that FQHCs dwarf anything Planned Parenthood does. But FQHCs do not do abortions. And they do many more services than Planned Parenthood does. So don't let anyone tell you that Planned Parenthood is needed. And without Planned Parenthood, women will die or suffer. That's bullshit. We often hear that uh, pro-lifers only care about a baby until it's born. Once it's born, you don't care. They say things like, are you going to pay for that baby? Are you going to adopt all these babies that are unwanted, right? The fact of the matter is they know this is a lie. They know it. And that's why someone like Elizabeth Warren has to lie about crisis pregnancy centers and say that, you know, they're liars and manipulators and they're hiding information from women. The fact of the matter is that there are 2,533 crisis pregnancy centers throughout the country. If you're watching and you see this map here of the United States and you see all these dots, all these dots are not indications of one location. They're indications of 50, 80, 99, 93, 70, and so on. These are how many are in that each of those locations and those dots. And all these places, they offer finances, financial help, health care, clothing, diapers, navigating government services. And all of this help and support is on top of all the government services that are out there for people who are poor. Massive numbers of support and help for people who are in tough situations financially or whatever the case may be. Crisis pregnancy centers are everywhere. So anyone who says that you only care about a baby until it's born, then forget it, is lying to you. They know this information. And we're not even talking about churches and other private organizations that offer all sorts of help to people. So the amount of help is over a lot of rape right rape is uh obviously a horrible horrible evil that's uh that that is is plagued the world the question is what do we do with the rapist let's start with them right in this country a rapist gets prison time years certainly not always even life these two individuals here are uh, on the left are serial rapists, right? We did not give them the death penalty. It's not legal to give them the death penalty in this country. We could. These are the methods of, couple methods of the death penalty if it does occur, but it doesn't occur for rape. Should we give the baby the death penalty? Does the baby, the innocent baby who did nothing wrong, who's still a life, should they be given the death penalty because of what their rapist did? I don't believe that they should. It doesn't make it any less wrong to kill an innocent per person. And if we th and look at these two images of these ultrasounds on the left and the center, right? Which one is an image? Which one is an image of... Uh, of a baby conceived in rape, right? Which one? <laughs> you don't know, and that's the whole point, right? The woman on the bottom left was conceived in rape, and she's a pro-life advocate, right? This, this young man here was conceived in rape. This is his mom who was raped. 
right? His mom was raped and chose life. And now they have a great relationship. Her name is Cassandra. I've had her on my show. She's a great person. She's a lawyer. Uh, and this is her and her grown now grown son who she gave life to. And there were stories everywhere about people who were conceived in rape or who gave birth to after being raped and have a loving relationship uh, with their child. We don't need to give the death penalty to the baby. I hear this a lot, the one that really gets me. It really, really gets me. I, I've never understood it, um, especially coming from the left who claim to be so pro-woman and feminist and so on, is that women need abortion to be successful. I even heard, uh, it was a couple years ago, a young girl who was graduating from high school gave a speech and said, basically, thank God for abortion because I need it in order to be successful. If I were to get pregnant, I, I, it would affect my ability to finish college, right? And become whatever it is I wanna be in life. And that's so insulting to women as though they're not capable of succeeding even with a pregnancy. What about these two women? On the top left, Jen Psaki, you may recognize her, Biden's former uh, press secretary, has babies. Kaylee McEnany, uh, uh, Trump's uh, press secretary, has babies. Amy Coney Barrett, she's a she's a lawyer. She's a law prof she was a law professor at Notre Dame, right? She's she's a Supreme Court justice now. And if you watched her in her her confirmation hearing, an extremely impressive individual. She's had many babies. Madison Jesiato uh, Gilbert. If I don't know if any of you know her, she ran for Congress here in in, in Ohio. Right. She lost, unfortunately, but she still ran. This is a picture of her. Oops. This is a picture of her and her husband. In the top, she was pregnant during the campaign. She gave birth and then continued campaigning. Right. Again, she lost, but she could have won. But what a great thing that she did here. And the bottom picture on the right is isn't a real person. It's a it's a doctor because there are many, many, many female doctors out there, top doctors who have babies, multiple babies. I know them. They're phenomenal people and they, they can do it. Even a job as difficult and stressful as that, yet they do it. To me, that's an indication of power and strength. The left says they can't even do something close to any of these things unless they have access to abortion. That's a lie. And they know it. And we also get the no uterus, no opinion. What about men? Jerry, you shouldn't even be talking about this. You don't, you're not a woman. Well, what about these men in these pictures here? These men, these are their babies. They love their children. They should have a say in this. And apparently seven of these nine men had a say in what goes on with a woman's body. Apparently, you're okay with that, with those men having a, an opinion, but I'm not allowed. It's a lie. Men do and should have an opinion. You know, and speaking of fathers, when you think about this, I often wondered if fathers can abort, if they can abort their responsibility, right? Can a father, a man say, hey, I got you pregnant, but, you know, I'm poor. I lost my job. I'm in college and I'm, I, I'm not ready to be a dad. So yeah, good luck to you. Of course not. They'd be called deadbeat dads. Their pictures would be up on a, a, a billboard on the side of the, on, on the highway, right? The police would come after them. They would be taken to court by, by the mother. And we as a society would look at them as deadbeat dads. Rightfully so. They need to, need to step up. But yet a woman could say, I'm poor and I'm not ready to be a mom and walk down to Planned Parenthood and kill her baby. Why the double standard? Both men and women should stand up, step up and give life to that baby. I want to finish up as we, we finish up just one note of what's going on here in Ohio. Uh, that's where I'm from, and that's where Kent State is from, of course. There is a ballot initiative coming up here in Ohio, uh, and it is a ballot initiative that, if passed, will be on the Ohio Constitution and will essentially give unfettered access to abortion. 
and that'll be extremely, extremely dangerous to all the people, specifically women, because it gets rid of, of a number of protections for women. It gives unfettered access for abortion, and it really uh, inhibits parental rights as well for minors. Uh, so, you know, please get involved. Make sure you as college students, if you're a college student, that you get registered to vote and that you get out and vote. Uh, this is very, very important here in Ohio. Uh, please make sure if you want more information, go to protectwomenohio.com uh, and learn a little bit more about it. But I just want to make a note for that for those of us here in Ohio. But I want to leave you with this. And I, I show these pictures and I use these pictures. I know they're grotesque. I know they're hard to watch. It, it could even make you nauseous. But again, just like the opening video, this is what this is all about. The side that wins decides whether or not this happens and is legal in this country and each of your states. This is not a difference of opinion on tax policy or trade policy. This is the difference between life and death, good and evil. Pick the side of life. Pick the side of of goodness and righteousness and stand up for these little babies who cannot stand up for themselves. That's what I'll leave you with. Um, this last slide here is just some information on me. Again, my name is Jerry Serino. I'm the, uh, uh, one of the things that I do is I'm a host of a podcast called Feed Ace Podcast. Feed Ace, F-I-D-E-S. Feed Ace is Latin for um, faithful, knowledge, faith, truth, um, that's what my show is about. Um, please check out my podcast and any podcast app that's out there. I'm on all of them. I'm on YouTube. I'm on Rumble. Uh, please like and subscribe. Leave me a comment. I'd appreciate it. Share my podcast wherever you get your podcasts with your friends or your relatives. Let them hear this. If you're a Kent State student and you were here for this um, for this presentation, send this to your parents. Send this to your siblings who are maybe not in college yet and are um, in high school or younger. Let them listen to it. Your parents, your aunts, uncles, send it to everybody, please. Um, but you can connect to me on any of these social medias that you see here on the screen or just look me up. Uh, again, Jerry Serino, The Fide Show, F-I-D-E-S, on any podcast app or social media, please connect. I'd love to be connected with you. And uh, you could also catch my show on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern on writeamericamedia.com. All right, so thank you all very, very much, and we'll see you next time.